And today we're going to embark on, on a uh, discussion about uh, air quality law. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start with uh, really uh, a, a, uh, an assertion by the Environmental Protection Agency uh, that uh, I've come to think of as a, a myth of sorts. Uh, when they have, cl have claimed that the nation's air quality has improved dramatically in the past 25 years. Well, how would you know if that's true? <clears throat> uh, how would you contest that? What kind of evidence would you want? And uh, what we'll find today is that uh, your answer to this really depends upon uh, what pollutants you choose to measure, uh, what you know about the toxicity of different pollutants, uh, where you measure the pollutants. Do you measure them uh, in a fixed monitor out in a, a field someplace in the middle of uh, uh, northeastern Connecticut, uh, or do you do it uh, next to a highway in, in New Haven or Bridgeport? Uh, and how you spend your time. Uh, where do you spend the majority of your time? Uh, I bet it's not where EPA measures pollut pollutants. Uh, the majority of your time is spent indoors, I would guess, uh, overwhelmingly indoors. And uh, how do you behave indoors? Uh, <coughs> so, and by that I mean <coughs> how would your behavior affect your exposure to, to pollutants indoors. These are all questions that uh, became, uh, it became apparent late in the 20th century are, are really important to know whether or not law works. And you know, this law, uh, the Clean Air Act, uh, like uh, pesticide law, it, it has a very technical character to it. And I think that you can understand by now in the course that uh, in, you know, environmental law is not just about uh, making rules, it's about understanding uh, the environment and, and uh, how it works and, and how it responds to different kinds of human stresses. <coughs> and uh, also, it's, it's about uh, what we can do to re relieve those stresses. So there's a technical side to this that there is not in, in many other forms of law. <coughs> but uh, uh, so uh, is the environmental, is air quality improving? Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, if not, why? So think about uh, the different kinds of legal strategies and standards that have been designed to control air quality in history. Well, one is land use and zoning. <clears throat> so thinking about how you'd segregate different land uses. So you keep the industrial facilities or the, uh, uh, say, the military sites uh, away from the residential areas. So this idea of segregation or, or, or buffering uh, land uses where you know you, you have uh, high levels of emissions uh, from those where people reside uh, away from schools. This was one of the earliest forms of attempted control. And there are examples in, in London back in the 17th century of prohibiting certain kinds of facilities, rendering plants, uh, or uh, plants that produce a lot of smoke in the air uh, from being in, in residential areas. Uh, another approach to controlling air quality is the idea of setting a ceiling uh, or an allowable emission limit. Uh, so the, the, the idea that you would, uh, uh, chemical by chemical, set an allowable level of, of contamination uh, in the air has become really central to the way that we've thought about uh, trying to manage uh, our health. <coughs> so. Uh, have these policies been uh, developed in a way that's precautionary uh, to uh, prevent significant deterioration? And as, as you look at, at uh, uh, the structure of the Clean Air Act, you'll see that this idea of prevention of significant deterioration uh, is a really critical concept. So we don't, uh, as a nation, we've decided we don't really want to make the air quality worse uh, than it is, uh, that uh, we're, on a, uh, we're on a path toward uh, restoration or, or improvement in quality. We've also found that uh, uh, it's important to, to think differently about mobile sources than it is about stationary sources. And uh, you know, quite frankly, um, if you were the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency back in 1970 and you walked into this problem of having uh, uh, a zillion stacks in the country that were emitting dangerous chemicals, uh, you would concentrate on, on very visible uh, sources. So <clears throat> it's... Uh, it, it's a very different kind of a problem and one where we've made more progress because we could identify the stack and we could put monitors on those stacks uh, than what we face in indoor environments uh, when we don't really have any understanding of, of the kinds of chemicals that we're exposed to. Uh, Transboundary flows of pollution have been uh, traditionally very difficult to control. Uh, the Canadians are, are pretty upset with us in the way that we transfer uh, much of the, the uh, uh, air pollution that is produced in the Midwestern United States uh, up across central and uh, uh, northeastern Canada. Uh, so <laughs> as is New York upset with uh, Ohio and the power plants in Ohio uh, that are burning more coal and uh, the pollutants from Ohio are moving into New York. So how do we control transboundary movements uh, across state boundaries or across uh, even local boundaries uh, or the most difficult uh, situation would be national boundaries. 
uh, property rights to pollute. Uh, this is an interesting idea. Uh, and really, this, this idea that you could uh, uh, set uh, an allowable ceiling, uh, and instead of telling every uh, person that lives in that region that they have to comply with a certain level of emission, uh, that you put a cap on the total emission for that region. Uh, and then gradually, you lower that cap down. So this is the idea of cap and trade. And it really grew out of an attempt to control acid precipitation uh, associated with, with uh, sulfur dioxides and, and nitrogen oxides uh, that uh, uh, caused a whole array of problems, including uh, a loss of uh, a certain species. Uh, so in the Adirondacks, I, I take a seminar to the Adirondacks uh, in the fall every year. Uh, all the lakes above 2,500 feet in elevation don't have trout in the Adirondacks because of the way that uh, SO2 and, and uh, NOx uh, create <coughs> acid aerosols that rain down and make those lakes too, too acidic for those uh, fish to, to, uh, to grow. Uh, buildings around uh, the world have been deteriorated, especially if they're made out of limestone because of, of acid aerosols. Uh, the uh, red spruce at high elevations on, in uh, uh, the northeastern US, up on Mount Washington, or up in the Adirondacks or the Green Mountains, uh, those red spruce are in decline, uh, and the decline is, is caused by the fact that clouds hang over the tops of these mountain peaks, and uh, the, the fog itself uh, is, is acid, uh, so that uh, it's causing vulnerability to different illnesses. So <clears throat> capping and, and trading is, is now believed to be the more efficient way to reduce uh, pollution, uh, and it really, <coughs> the, the idea began initially uh, with environmental defense when it was called Environmental Defense Fund, uh, but it now has become really the, the uh, uh, cornerstone of, of attempts to control uh, the CO2 problem that we face. Uh, technology forcing standards. So what if your technology is not capable of reducing emission to the level that uh, uh, you want it to be? Well, you can set an aspirational standard. And by that, I mean that uh, you give a, uh, an industry or a sector a certain period of time within which they would have to reduce their emissions. By the way, it's uh, only fitting that I can smell uh, diesel exhaust in here today. I don't know if anybody else can smell it, but uh, uh, it must be from the construction equipment. It's a fitting, uh, a fitting uh, topic uh, for the air quality in the room. I should have my little monitor here. So the idea that uh, you would create uh, these aspirational standards uh, was embedded into the Clean Air Act. Uh, fuel content regulations. It's a very, I think it's an interesting uh, issue that uh, we, we've been more concerned about what, what comes out of the stacks and what comes out of the tailpipes uh, than we have about controlling the fuel and uh, the, the process of its burning in order to reduce those emissions. So the idea of, of filtering what uh, is coming out at the, uh, the end of the process, the, the combustion process, as opposed to thinking more carefully about uh, the nature of the fuel. We made serious mistakes uh, in, in uh, history thinking about leaded fuel as an example. So uh, lead was added to fuel to, to make uh, uh, engines more efficient, to knock less, and to, to make them uh, less prone to breakdown. Uh, but it spewed lead uh, around the world. And uh, recognizing that lead got into the bones of children and uh, uh, induced developmental and neurological disorders, that's a very important story. So fuel content regulation, in, in a way, there's an interesting similarity to uh, the way that uh, uh, we feed animals. Uh, so kind of neglecting. Uh, neglecting residues that are in animal feed or uh, neglecting the strontium-90 that uh, uh, was in the, uh, the, the feed that uh, went into to, uh, uh, cattle and then uh, made its way to, uh, to our dinner plates. Uh, it's, it's similar to, to uh, neglecting uh, the content of fuel and, and just not caring about where it's going to go. Uh, so thinking about uh, residues out there in the ambient environment as the target for regulation as opposed to the underlying source, either the, the uh, technology, the engine, or, or the, the uh, type of fuel that, that is burned. So indoor behavioral regulation, we'll, we'll see that uh, after the break when we come back and, and look at tobacco regulation. Uh, so thinking about uh, uh, what is the, the right of the government to regulate uh, what we do indoors uh, in, in our houses uh, as opposed to outdoors. Uh, and the idea of building certification standards and development certification standards. Uh, more commonly today than ever before, uh, we're seeing a variety of different land use regulations structured in a way that uh, are designed to uh, reduce energy consumption or to, to uh, uh, guide it in a way that produces less air pollution. So here's a suite of strategies that might be used to control air quality in a variety of different situations. So just a couple of, of uh, quick slides on, on uh, key points relative to the structure of, of the Clean Air Act. Uh, we have air quality control regions. 
So each state has to set up a designated area as either in attainment uh, or non-attainment. Uh, and if you're in attainment, you meet the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, NAAQS. Uh, and states have to put together state implementation plans. Uh, the idea being that, that uh, states would have a better capacity to, to uh, know the behavior of, of sources of emissions and it would have uh, a better ability to, to monitor what's going on and to enforce uh, <coughs> violations of, of the statute. So <coughs> the state implementation plans have to have uh, uh, established enforceable limits, uh, methods for acquiring air quality data, meaning that they've got to set up a surveillance system. Uh, also, boundaries have to be well, well uh, identifiable. Uh, they have to set up an enforcement program and also have to demonstrate how they are controlling uh, release of pollutants that uh, could cross state boundaries. Uh, and also, they have to set up reporting requirements back to the Environmental Protection Agency. So what happens if a state implementation plan fails? Uh, I asked that question of the, the head of the Air Quality Division at the Department of Environmental Protection who was responsible for, for Connecticut's uh, state implementation plan. And, and he said, well, you know, we could have our highway funds uh, revoked uh, or we could have them seriously diminished. I said, well, how often does that happen? Uh, first, I said, well, how often are you out of compliance with uh, uh, the, the, the requirements of the, uh, the limits for the national ambient standards or the hazardous air pollutants? And he said, oh, quite often. <clears throat> In fact, uh, southern Connecticut and especially in the New Haven region uh, is, is out of compliance for ozone and particulate matter uh, routinely. <clears throat> and I said, well, does that mean that the state has, has uh, uh, been forced to uh, uh, recommend to EPA to, to restrict highway funds? And he looked at me and he said, well, no, we never really would do that. And I said, does that mean that EPA has never uh, restricted or, or reduced highway funds to the state? And uh, the answer was no. So <laughs> you've got a uh, uh, monitoring burden. Uh, you've got an enforcement burden that uh, really is not working. So you've got uh, primary and secondary standards. Uh, and the primary standards uh, have to be set to protect human health. And the secondary standards are set to protect environmental quality and property. And uh, you recall the, uh, the, the effect of acid precipitation on, on building uh, stone as, as an example. Criteria pollutants are listed uh, <clears throat> so that this is a listing statute just like the Safe Drinking Water Act is. That, that, uh, the, the analogy there would be the maximum contaminant levels, but also the Endangered Species Act. And because it, uh, is a, it is a statute where the chemical has to be listed before it gets any attention or is limited, then it has the same uh, political dynamics as those other two statutes. Uh, everybody fights about which chemical is going to be placed on the list. So <clears throat> there are also a class of chemicals, uh, about 190, that are called hazardous air pollutants. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm going to go through these uh, just quickly. The criteria pollutants uh, that are, uh, were initially believed to be dangerous to health include particulates, SO2, NOx, carbon monoxide, uh, ozone, and, and lead. And uh, by the way, all of these chemicals uh, are either uh, emitted or they are uh, created from auto automobile exhaust, just as one example. But then we have uh, this other category that's called hazardous air pollutants. Uh, asbestos, mercury, arsenic, beryllium, vinyl chloride, uh, benzene, benzene is a known human carcinogen, radionuclides, coke oven emissions, and coal tars. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, there is this ambiguity, this, this um, uh, ambiguity in language that's embedded to the, into the act. Clearly the criteria pollutants are dangerous. Uh, they're hazardous. Uh, and um, the government has paid a lot of attention to these six compounds uh, and not much attention to the hazardous air pollutants uh, that uh, include volatile organic compounds that uh, uh, are, are some of which are, are uh, ozone precursors. So how are these standards set? What do they look like? Well, this is, uh, it gets a, a bit technical and I'm not going to spend much time on it, but uh, there's been an increasing sensitivity uh, about the danger of particulate matter uh, if it is superfine. So originally EPA went after particulate matter 10, which is 10 microns in diameter uh, in, in, in size, and had neglected anything that was finer. Uh, so that uh, the, eventually standards were set for PM 2.5, uh, but take a look at the units here. The units here are kind of fascinating. So uh, for P just take PM 2.5 because we're going to be talking about that with respect to diesel emissions. 90% of diesel emissions are actually uh, PM 1 or less so that they are uh, uh, really quite fine. So it's set at 15 micrograms per cubic meter. I mean, it's hard to wrap your head around what that means. 
uh, or 65 micrograms uh, per cubic meter uh, as a uh, yearly average. And I'll come back to the averaging issue. And, uh, and for some of the pollutants, there's an annual average. Uh, for some pollutants, there's a 24 average. Uh, and this is extremely important. So there's a politic uh, uh, that surrounds the averaging period that, that uh, EPA has allowed. And by the way, when EPA wants to establish a new limit, how do they do it? Well, they publish a notice in the Federal Register. How many of you have ever commented on a Clean Air Act uh, standard uh, being proposed uh, in the Federal Register? How many of you have ever, have ever had, really, you've done that? Uh, well, that's great. You're the first student in about 10 years that's raised his hand. Uh, <laughs> but very few people pay attention to the Federal Register, and very few people have the capacity to, uh, to comment in, in a, a technical way uh, that would be potentially effective. Uh, so here are, here are the ozone standards, the carbon monoxide standards, and, and uh, lead standards, and they all have different averaging periods. Well, it's worth your reflection on how those averaging periods are established. I'm not going to go into that uh, except with respect to PM 2.5 today. So um, the hazardous air pollutant provisions were largely neglected by EPA, uh, and Congress got upset in 1990 because only seven chemicals were regulated. By the way, uh, there are six uh, national ambient standards set, you know, PM and CO and lead that I just showed you. Uh, there, are, there were seven standards set for hazardous air pollutants uh, as of 1990. And Congress said, what? This doesn't make any sense. So how many air pollutants are there anyway? Well, just in uh, uh, wood smoke is one example, or, or tobacco smoke, there are between uh, two and 4,000 different particles, uh, different compounds. So particles of different size. Uh, so so uh, the, the attention of government on so few compounds is really quite striking. So Congress said, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing with that, the hazardous air pollutants? And, and uh, EPA said, well, you know, we've just been so overwhelmed trying to figure out how to manage uh, emissions from stacks. And we, we've uh, uh, had a hard time in, in uh, just dealing with six of the ambient standards. Uh, so we haven't paid much attention to it. So they established uh, separate categories in the amendments of 1990. Uh, this set of amendments was probably the most important set of amendments in, uh, in the history of the, uh, the Clean Air Act. And it uh, categorized minor and major sources uh, and put into place the maximum achievable control technology standard. Maximum achievable control technology. So it basically is forward looking uh, thinking about uh, the potential of technology and in some instances setting standards that are beyond what technology could current uh, meet. But offsets were also allowed uh, to uh, reduce hazardous air pollutants within plants. And what that means is, is that if you're a refinery, say uh, there's a, a huge refinery with about uh, 100 uh, different stacks that, that uh, exists between Los Angeles and uh, uh, San Diego, on the uh, eastern side of, of uh, the I-5, and uh, it, has, it has so many stacks coming out of it that uh, those refineries and other industries, uh, large chemical companies, went to EPA and said, well, look, I don't wanna, we don't want to have to meet uh, these standards for every stack. Uh, can, for, for the ones where I'm em emitting uh, uh, lower levels than what would be allowable, can I use that as an offset for uh, uh, the emissions for the stack that's emitting more than is allowable? And uh, this provision was enacted to allow the companies to play a greater role in trying to figure out how they could re reduce their overall emissions. Well, uh, today for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, what I want to do is I want to focus on uh, vehicle emissions uh, because it, it's a, it, extremely important to our energy future and our climate future, uh, but it's also extremely important to our health. It's affecting us quite differentially uh, based upon where we live, how we behave, uh, and also our ethnicity. So, and this is because uh, different uh, ethnic groups have different background susceptibility. So all the principles that we talked about with respect to uh, pesticides and strontium-90 about, gee, you know, not everybody's exposed in the same way, or not everybody is equally vulnerable, or some people have background illnesses. Well, this is a story in part about the genetic susceptibility of certain populations that ha have a higher prevalence of respiratory illness uh, than others. For example, whites uh, have a lower level of uh, lo lower prevalence of, of asthma uh, in the United States than do African Americans. Uh, and uh, people of Puerto Rican descent have the highest in the nation. Uh, so that, that, uh, that's very difficult to explain. It's difficult to tease out 
whether or not uh, there's a relationship between uh, the uh, uh, smaller ethnic groups and their, their, uh, where they live in, inside urban areas. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, a, a separate debate about whether or not there's uh, a genetic characteristic that makes them more susceptible. So I want you to think about uh, the vehicle problem for a moment, uh, which I think of as uh, enormously complicated uh, and enormously important. So that uh, it's the, the way that we've been managing our consumption of fuel and vehicles and the way that we've used public subsidies to, to uh, allow us to move more freely around our, our landscape uh, has had just an enormous effect on, on uh, our health, uh, our behavior, uh, as well as, as the quality of the environment. 235 million vehicles in the U.S., about 320 million people in the U.S., so that there's now a, a one vehicle in the country for everybody that has a driver's license or is eligible for a driver's license. So three trillion mi uh, miles have been traveled uh, in, in the past year. Uh, 200 billion gallons of fuel, $600 billion per year at $3 per gallon, and the average uh, fuel efficiency of vehicles in the U.S. is about 17 miles per gallon. Some of you are helping me with a, uh, a study of trucking and, and barging in an effort to try to, to uh, think about reducing uh, uh, diesel emissions uh, from trucks, trailer, tractor trailer trucks uh, coming up 95. So the Port Authority in, in New Jersey receives about, uh, <coughs> or about 5 million uh, of the containers that come in on barges to the Port Authority make their way up uh, into Connecticut <coughs> across the uh, New York border and uh, uh, move up toward Boston and, and uh, deliver goods in southern Connecticut and, and uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and, and also in the Boston area. So that uh, you know, one of, the, one of the issues that we're looking at is could we do something that would uh, uh, employ barges to move those containers so that it would avoid the, the, uh, uh, the adverse effects associated with uh, uh, trucking moving through the region, which is in, in part uh, related to uh, their, their climate influence, but also uh, the, the really bad air quality in Connecticut surrounds the I-95 corridor and the I-91 interchange uh, moving up toward Hartford. Those trucks, by the way, get about uh, five to five and a half miles per gallon. <clears throat> How about uh, the lag in adoption of technology forcing standards? So say that you were the EPA administrator and you decided you wanted to do something about uh, this low diameter uh, particle, <clears throat> and you uh, uh, published a regulation and uh, went through the comment period, uh, by the way, that uh, is, is governed by the Administrative Procedures Act. and. <clears throat> and uh, you mandated a reduction in, say, NOx and, and PM. Uh, in the case of, of, of particulate matter uh, and, and NOx, <coughs> this standard was adopted back in, uh, proposed to be adopted back in uh, the late 1990s, 1998, uh, and <coughs> eventually it was adopted uh, following litigation and following the Whitman versus American Trucker decision went into force, uh, but it didn't phase in uh, to make any changes until 2006 and 2010 uh, in requirements for engine design. So you, you need to think about uh, kind of the, the uh, uh, last night in section I said it's like a, a, the glacial pace of regulation. So supposing the science is really clear and it tells you that, that uh, uh, the current level of air quality or current emissions are really dangerous and, and that there's a, a link between disease in the population and, and, and the emission levels and you want to do something about it. Well, it's going to take you uh, probably between 10 and 15 years to see any difference at all in the regulations. And <clears throat> what else is, is uh, at play here? What's the average uh, life cycle of a car? Well, now it's approaching 20 years in the nation. And what's the average life cycle of uh, one of these long distance trucks? Well, that's getting close to 30 years. For some of them, it's even 35 years. And by the way, they don't throw those engines away at the end of 35 years. Uh, they often move them into agricultural purposes or the, uh, the, the last resort of use for the least efficient uh, uh, diesel engine is, is now the, the fishing fleet. <coughs> so that uh, old engines don't go away. So, so this tells you that uh, just adopting a new regulation that, that uh, is technology forcing that is going to demand a, a new uh, engine design that will emit less, it's not likely to make a difference for a long period of time given the, this, this long life cycle of the current vehicle stock. Particulate standards. <clears throat> so uh, they revised the standard, I said 98 a minute ago, it's 1997, and it focused health concerns on mortality studies. And basically they began to find that the finer particles are more dangerous. And this 
Uh, I mean, <laughs> thinking about it physiologically, anybody that has had physiology, uh, this should be quite intuitive to you. So why would finer particles be more dangerous? Okay, yes? Well, absorbed immediately into the bloodstream. Um, <clears throat> they are absorbed into the bloodstream, but why, why would finer particles be more easily absorbed than, than uh, larger diameter particles? Another good point. These small carbon particles act as a nucleus, and they, they're sticky, uh, and they attract volatile organic compounds. Yes? The small particles can um, get through like, your body's natural um, defense mechanisms and your like, nostrils and stuff like that. Okay. <clears throat> the larger particles are filtered out higher up in the nas nasal pharyngeal cavity. The smaller particles can be uh, embedded more deeply into your lung, uh, and they can carry, therefore, uh, these other uh, compounds along with them. So the finer particles are more dangerous. And we had started out with the regulation of PM10, went to the regulation of PM2.5, and now most people are thinking, wow, you know, diesel emissions are 90% PM1. Uh, why aren't we regulating at PM1 or, or even lower than that? In part, it's a detection technology issue. Uh, it's more expensive to detect the, the finer particles, um, more cumbersome for uh, states to, to try to set up a monitoring and, and surveillance program. So what are the latest PM standards? 15 micrograms per cubic meter, and I want you to focus on one phrase here. These are daily averages, and they're then averaged over three years. Averaged over three years? Hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, when I first read that, and I hadn't really studied any of the science, I said to myself, well, that must mean that, uh, you know, the short bursts of pollution really don't make any difference. You know, I always thought that uh, uh, it was not really a particularly good thing to hang out uh, behind a, a truck or a bus on the highway that was blowing... Uh, uh, diesel smoke and that there must be, there must be uh, <coughs> uh, uh, a better way to, uh, to drive. So that uh, in this case, uh, absolutely the opposite is true. <coughs> the literature, the scientific literature, if you uh, do a, a, a careful scan, it's very clear that even short bursts of pollution uh, can have an adverse effect on, on the respiration rate and uh, also uh, on people that have background illnesses. So that if you look at uh, the tunnel studies, for example, in Europe, uh, in Switzerland and in uh, Germany, particularly through the Alps, where you have a lot of diesel truck traffic that uh, move through those tunnels, and they're often backed up in the tunnels. So the air quality in those tunnels is, is exceptionally bad. The Lincoln Tunnel is another good example of that. <clears throat> so that they found, a, they found that uh, people were having respiratory symptoms, using uh, medication more often, or <clears throat> had to visit the doctor or, or be admitted to emergency rooms uh, more often following these short bursts of, of exposure. So the short bursts actually count. <laughs> With Reed uh, Whitman versus American Trucking, it's a really interesting decision. Uh, <clears throat> the Clean Air Act, uh, the Supreme Court uh, concluded, unambiguously, bar unambiguously bars cost consideration from the standard setting process. Further, it requires EPA to set standards requisite to protect the public health, allowing an adequate margin of safety. <clears throat> so uh, this is not a case uh, like the early pesticide law of balancing risks versus benefits. Uh, no, no consideration of the, the uh, cost to the trucking industry or to the auto industry or to the, the utilities uh, can be at play as EPA decides what the level uh, is supposed to be. <clears throat> By the way, just the claim uh, that, that EPA had the responsibility to balance benefits <clears throat> caused this implementation of the PM standard to be delayed for three years while it was uh, moving its way through the courts. What about the health benefit of the new PM standards? EPA estimated that <clears throat> when they were fully implemented this year, hooray, okay, they decided in 1997 that they wanted this new standard uh, to protect health uh, so that uh, it's fully implemented this year. Uh, 8,300 fewer premature deaths were estimated uh, to be the result. 17,000 fewer cases of childhood acute bronchitis and 360,000 fewer asthma attacks. Well, this is per year, by the way. So EPA was estimating that every year of delay in the implementation of this standards, these are the health outcomes. Now, how would you cost that out economically? Well, how, how would you cost out, uh, uh, say, asthma? What, what factors would you consider in thinking about uh, uh, what, the, what the value to society might be if you wanted to put this question into a more utilitarian cost-benefit uh, framework? Uh, 
Well, <clears throat> one of the things that you would certainly consider would be the, the uh, medical costs, costs of medical care. So physician costs, emergency room visits, uh, and, and uh, also you, you have to be uh, aware that, that those that are poorest in society have the least health coverage, and they tend to be the ones, if they're asthmatic, that don't get routine care. So the severity of response is a function of whether or not you get routine care. Uh, and uh, great studies about numbers of uh, doctor's visits uh, related to numbers of hospital admissions. So the more routine care you get, the less likely you are to go into the hospital. So it costs society less, especially for people that uh, are on, on Medicaid or, or, or Medicare. Uh, so other costs that uh, might be considered could be uh, trying to, to uh, uh, figure out how to bring your child back up to speed in the classroom uh, because uh, asthma is responsible for uh, uh, more lost, lost school days than any other illness among kids. Also, when a child stays home, uh, when my daughter gets sick, uh, either uh, my wife or I have to stay home as well. So lost work days also should be accounted. I had an interesting question last night posed about, well, what about uh, the economic benefits side of the equation? Uh, so uh, should you also consider some of the, uh, the benefits of uh, prescribing drugs? Uh, or uh, benefits uh, to, the, to a hospital of, of uh, uh, paying, uh, having uh, uh, the, uh, the, the profit that's associated with, with use of uh, the drugs or the, or the medical services. So, I mean, setting up the accounting system, is a, it's actually a, a very tricky business. Uh, now, this problem of what's coming out of vehicles has to be thought about in the context of what else is, is uh, being spewed into the air. So, uh, small diameter particles are not just coming from vehicles, they're coming from power plants. Uh, so that uh, this map of where the, the uh, coal-fired power plants are located, uh, this is an old map, but just, uh, I, I'm using it just to make the point uh, that there are other sources of particle emission, uh, other sources of combustion. Forest fires in the, uh, in the western part of the United States, in California, also produce similar kinds of, of, of uh, particles. And uh, so that uh, the background level of PM uh, in north e the northeastern United States is really serious. Uh, other uh, other uh, sources include uh, uh, right here in New Haven, uh, for example, the, the tankers that come into the, the oil tank farm here in, in the port. Uh, and why is that significant? Well, it's not as significant here as it would be, say, in Long Beach uh, or San Diego, uh, where you have uh, a much higher intensity of shipment. Uh, but these, these uh, barges uh, do tend to burn high sulfur fuel, <coughs> so that uh, we're now burning sulfur fuel, uh, diesel fuel, uh, that's about 15 parts per million sulfur. That's the new mandate under these new regulations. So the lower the sulfur content, the lower the PM level. Uh, now, however, there are certain parts of the country that are allowed to burn 500 parts per million. And the military in, uh, in Iraq is allowed to burn 3,000 parts per million. Uh, by the way, that's why, that's why if you ever see a, like a, a convoy of the National Guard going down the highway and you're behind them in a car, uh, it absolutely reeks because they're burning this uh, 3,000 part per million fuel uh, when your car or your diesel vehicle, your, your diesel car was burning only 15 parts per million. And there are parts of the country where, where uh, it's allowable to burn the higher sulfur fuels, surprisingly including uh, some parts of Alaska. So uh, think about uh, uh, where else these particles are coming from. We also burn diesel fuel uh, in Connecticut, especially because we don't have a, a good national, natural gas source. We burn it in, in our uh, furnaces to heat our houses. It's virtually the same kind of fuel, except it's allowed to have a higher sulfur content. And also railroads along uh, 95. So the railroad corridor, the highway corridor, uh, on top of uh, coal-fired power plant emissions, uh, on top of uh, uh, commercial emissions, uh, these are all sources. Yes, question. Uh, it's cheaper. So getting the sulfur out of the fuel is, is a, a more expensive process. The question was, uh, is, is uh, high sulfur fuel uh, more or less expensive? And, and uh, high sulfur fuel is, is less expensive. So it's a, a matter of the degree of refinement of the, of the fuel. So that in Connecticut, <coughs> did a quick calculation and found that we're burning about 230 million gallons per year of diesel fuel in vehicles. <coughs> but we're burning almost three times that amount uh, in houses, in people's houses. And that has not been the subject of regulation or attention on the part of EPA. That is interesting to me. So that we're, we're burning diesel fuel right in, uh, I'm burning diesel fuel in my basement in my house. 
I better be sure that uh, it's my my basement is and my my furnace is pretty well ventilated, uh, and not everybody you know takes care to uh, to monitor how how efficient their furnace is. Uh, they may let that go, especially in uh, tough economic times like this. But your exposure could be uh, really quite significant if you had a furnace that was out of out of uh, uh, efficiency. So particle size definitions: coarse is greater than 2.5, fine is less than 2.5, but greater than 0.1. And ultrafine, just so that you know, a little bit of uh, air pollution trivia. Uh, the diesel exhaust that you see here is only PM10. Uh, so PM10 is just about the, the limit of visibility, uh, which is kind of curious because uh, m most people think that uh, diesel emissions are, are much cleaner than they used to be, uh, that, that somehow we've, uh, we've managed to uh, uh, get rid of uh, many of the, the smokers, as, as EPA calls them. Uh, with more efficient designs or, or with particle traps, uh, but in, in fact, uh, we're producing, uh, yes, finer particles, but we're producing more of them. So the idea that uh, uh, you have more finer particles uh, that actually have greater surface area to lock on to these other kinds of uh, volatile compounds that I was describing earlier. Uh, that is one hypothesis about uh, why we're seeing, why we saw the rise in, in, uh, in asthma in the nation during the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, so what's, uh, what is in diesel exhaust? Uh, what's the, what is the 2.5? Basically, it's elemental carbon, uh, a smaller amount of organic carbon, some sulfates and nitrates, uh, and some metals. Excuse me, going the wrong way. Here is a, a, a diagram that shows uh, particle size uh, moving from 10 part per million uh, down to uh, uh, one hundredth of a part per, per million, or micron, excuse me. And this is taken from Wilson and Spangler uh, on, uh, on a book on indoor air quality. So that you see the larger diameter particles are taken uh, out pretty much by the upper nasal, far na nasal pharyngeal cavity, whereas the lower particles uh, do tend to, to uh, get more deeply embedded in the lung. So uh, let me talk just for a few minutes about asthma uh, and asthma prevalence in the country. Uh, so about 7 million kids now have asthma, about uh, 22 million ad adults. It's the number one uh, reason for school absenteeism. And there are other critical questions about uh, what it means to have asthma, uh, what the effects are on academic performance, socialization, and depression. And I was teaching a seminar here at the Yale uh, New Haven Teachers Institute uh, about uh, seven years ago. And I asked one of, uh, one of the people in the class what the percentage of kids in his class was uh, that uh, had registered medications with a school nurse. He said he didn't know, but he came back and he said uh, it's about 24% of his kids in his class had been physician diagnosed as having asthma. It's just, I said, 24%. Uh, that's really extraordinary. That's, uh, that's beyond epidemic. So <clears throat> thinking about how this has escaped public attention is really quite interesting. Mark Cullen, who's now at uh, head of internal medicine at Stanford, and I worked on an asthma uh, <clears throat> report along with a group called Environment and Human Health. And, and uh, when Mark was uh, here in internal medicine and headed up the environmental medicine unit, uh, we did a, st a survey in Connecticut uh, of asthma prevalence in schools. And we found it did range between 3 and about 22 percent, uh, school district to school district. Uh, this is really quite striking. We also found that the urban schools had the highest <clears throat> prevalence rates. So we then uh, uh, thought about, OK, well, what, is, what does this mean relative to uh, what we were thinking about in, in air quality? And this is uh, an aside, uh, by the way. And I just wanted to uh, show you the picture of a, a, a slice of a, a lung tissue that demonstrates what happens to the carbon uh, when it's inhaled. It doesn't just go away. It doesn't just dissolve. It, it will sit in your lung. Uh, and I've talked to many uh, of, of the uh, uh, surgeons at, at uh, Yale New Haven uh, who do uh, <coughs> sections uh, uh, and, and treat people with lung cancer. Um, and I, I got into this because my dad had lung cancer, and I was, uh, we were, I was thinking about uh, different forms of treatment that uh, he might uh, consider. And <coughs> I asked the question, well, uh, do you notice a difference between people that live in New Haven and people that do not, assuming that uh, the two groups are both non-smokers? And he said, oh, yes. Uh, you can tell. You can tell by the grayness. You can tell by the, the presence of, of these uh, carbon particles in the, the lung tissues. Uh, they, take, uh, they take certain uh, sections of the lung out for those that uh, uh, have operable lung cancer. Uh, 
So I then started thinking about, well, what other kinds of background illnesses would make one susceptible to uh, air pollution? And they would be uh, people that uh, were asthmatic, uh, kids and adults, those with chronic bronchitis, those with emphysema, those with coronary heart disease, and diabetes. And if you look on the right-hand side of this chart, uh, you'll see that, that uh, the numbers are uh, the number of people in the United States diagnosed with these different illnesses. And uh, you see the numbers are really quite striking. And you might uh, pause and say, well, what about diabetes or, or coronary heart disease? Uh, but this is very important to, to pay attention to. So uh, 15 uh, million people diagnosed with coronary heart disease. Well, they found that uh, diesel emissions have the capacity to, uh, to move through the bloodstream once they're inhaled, to cross the blood-brain barrier, and to move very widely through the body. And <clears throat> they also tend to slow down blood flow. They tend to act as a, uh, uh, a minor coagulant. Uh, so that uh, you can see a, an increase in hospital admissions uh, for coronary <coughs> events following pollution uh, episodes, uh, particularly during uh, uh, the summer months uh, in the northeastern United States. <coughs> so I'm going to run out of time in a few minutes, but I wanted to give you a sense of how we uh, understand air pollution in the state. And uh, we basically do this by the monitoring system set up by the state implementation plan that uh, sets up these fixed monitors at different sites. Uh, so there's one right over on State Street. <clears throat> there's one on Style Street, which is just across the, the uh, Q Bridge. And <clears throat> you see that they are uh, capable of picking up different kinds of pollutants. The Style Street uh, station picks up PM 2.5 and PM 10. Uh, another one in New Haven picks up PM 2.5. Uh, <clears throat> Madison Hammond Asset State Park picks up O3 uh, down here on the shoreline. And you might say, why Madison? Uh, and <clears throat> actually, Madison has some of the highest readings in the state for ozone. And it happens to be because uh, the rush hour traffic in New York uh, generally gets to this part of Connecticut uh, by about noon, when the sun is highest in the sky. So you have the ozone precur precursors coming in from New York, taking maybe uh, uh, four or five hours uh, after rush hour to get here. And then you get the, the, the sunlight uh, coming down and, and acting on them uh, in a way that uh, produces the ozone. <clears throat> so that uh, the, the concept here is we have about uh, uh, 30 different stations set up uh, with fixed monitoring. So uh, what, are, what do the monitoring sites tell us about uh, pollution and how variable it is across time? So this is a, a, a day from midnight uh, to midnight going across the bottom. Uh, and what you see here is uh, different months of the year represented by the different colored lines. And over here, uh, you see the PM levels. And PM 2.5 uh, is, is, uh, <clears throat> uh, has the, the standard of 15 microns as being the uh, federal limit. That's when it's averaged over a full day. And these, these uh, estimates are averaged over a day. And what you see here is that some months are clearly dirtier than other months are. For example, June tends to be, uh, uh, this, in this year at least, June was, was uh, uh, more polluted uh, than, say, December was. Uh, so that there are certain climatological patterns that are, are behind this. Uh, but you also see something else in this chart, which I think is quite curious. Uh, you see this, this effect. You see a, a decline coming in the early morning hours. You see a, a rise coming around uh, the, the uh, rush hour. Uh, you see a decline uh, uh, that's uh, more uh, in, in some months than others, coming back down for the lunch hour and then picking back up. This is a, this is a uh, uh, an artifact of, uh, of the, the uh, way that we drive vehicles and, and how we're all on a, a quite a similar schedule. And I'm going to leave you today with this diagram saying to, uh, saying to you that you need to think very carefully about these averaging periods. So I measured particles uh, at 10 second intervals. And they're represented by uh, these blue uh, squares. And <clears throat> if you take the same data, and you average that data over a minute, you get the pink squares. If you take a five minute moving average, you get the yellow. If you take uh, a one hour average, uh, you get the purple, and you get the red if you average it over eight hours. The PM 2.5 standard demands that, that the data be averaged over 24 hour periods, and then averaged over three years. So basically, it's going not even, uh, the, the way that EPA would read data would be over this 24 hour average, over three years. And <clears throat> you can tell from that that, that uh, uh, it would compress everything so that all of these values would be invisible. <clears throat>
even if you had blocks of time, like uh, three, four hours, where pollution was exceptionally high. So when you put that story together uh, with the idea that scientific literature is telling us that, that uh, you know, we need, to be, we need to pay attention to these, uh, these short bursts of pollution, uh, predominantly because people are, are uh, experiencing medical effects uh, that are now uh, <coughs> causing them to uh, seek medical attention. Okay, that's it today. Uh, we'll come back on Thursday.